Hi, I'm Richard Little. I coordinate the organic small grains breeding research and thank you Charles for, for a good lead in with the wheat research. Uh, we go a little f farther than just uh, working with one variety as in Charles's um, research and, and find that there are differences among the varieties in responses. Uh, our current project funded by Ceres Organic Trust is a follow-up to the OREI project on breeding small grains for organic systems. Bay State Milling and Harlan Mill have contributed substantially through quality testing and milling. Artisan Baker members of the Bread Bakers Guild of America are graciously volunteering time to do baking tests this year. Muted. The empty table provides an outline for how our story ends with 19 promising experimental hard winter wheat lines and varieties remaining out of 55 total tested over four years in our variety trials at four locations. We also tested 400 experimental lines at two locations each year that fed into the variety trial nursery. As we shall see, most of these promising lines um, have major drawbacks. The story also evolves from taking notes on a dozen traits including canopy cover and rust diseases to finally focusing on those that are really matter shown in, in the row across the top including coleoptal length, seed borne diseases, fusarium head blight, and whole wheat quality. Yield has almost become a secondary concern. Before I tell this story, I will give some background on hard wheat and adapted varieties. Because our small grains breeding program is in the plains, we are devoted to breeding hard winter wheat, which predominantly goes to the bread market. Other pockets outside of the Great Plains with significant hard winter wheat acreage are indicated in the brown ovals. The adaptation of uh, wheat lines developed at UNL is shown by the black circles. We also know that UNL and SDSU varieties are adapted to New England states based on recent testing there. The 1,200 crosses that we make each year have enough diversity to be adapted to the larger area represented by the red circles and beyond, likely beyond. <clears throat> For more background, I refer listeners to an e-organic webinar on winter wheat breeding basics. Now, next, I will talk about key traits and how our emphasis changed over time. Originally, we focused on the function, uh, functionality of white flour for making bread. When our advisors asked us to strive for nutrient density in our research, our focus shifted to whole grain flour since um, the wheat germ has higher levels of vitamins. With our new focus on whole wheat, we recognized that we needed to be more concerned about vomitoxin from fusarium infection of seeds, since it is concentrated in the bran layer. We also recognized that processing may be more important than genetics for retaining or releasing nutrients. For instance, two-thirds of ash content the minerals is in the bran, but it is not bioavailable unless it is released from its bonds to phytate, which is also present in wheat flour. It is possible to breed for lower levels of phytate and to increase levels of iron and zinc, which is a current project of USDA ARS at Lincoln. However, there is a quicker way to make the minerals available. Disable the phytate by fermenting with sourdough. Hence our recent focus on baking sourdough bread. The low pH conditions of sourdough have several, several favorable consequences for nutrient bioavailability and for improving bread volume of whole wheat bread. Low pH favors enzymes that deactivate phytate, favor, favor other enzymes that release the main phenolic antioxidant in wheat, the fer ferulic acid from its bonds with arabinoxylin in, in bran and enable other enzymes in some sourdough cultures to break down the razor-like bran fragments which puncture dough and keep bread from rising. Before we focus on sourdough, 
I was selecting only the strongest gluten lines to compensate for the effects of bran. This goal may no longer be valid with sourdough. Therefore, we've asked eight artisan bakers to bake loaves from whole ground flour by Heartland Mill using a standardized sourdough method developed by Tom Leonard. For later reference, notice the uh, two protein contents uh, for the cultivar being tested, in this case McGill. The loaves shown here are the early results from Jim Williams of Seven Stars Bakery in Rhode Island. To introduce you to our breeding challenges for other traits, I want to first describe a key challenge facing the organic wheat industry. Notice the high concentration of pink dots in the panhandle, which indicates many acres of wheat production. This is the same map with an overlay of organic farms <clears throat> represented with black dots. Notice the small number of organic farms rep, um, <clears throat> in comparison to the large wheat acreage. Think of how much more wheat is available to commercial millers to convention, of conventional flour than to organic millers. Think from a miller's perspective how much more difficult it is to blend wheat to certain specifications when there are so few sources. Now consider that three varieties predominate on organic farms across Nebraska. 70% of wheat sourced by Bay State milling in the area near the Wyoming border is buckskin. <clears throat> Carl 92 dominates organic farms in southeastern and south central Nebraska because most millers seek at least 12% grain protein. In 2009, Carl 92 at 13% protein was half a percent higher or more than most other varieties and was the only line that met Bay State Milling's criteria for baking quality among the 20 lines they tested for us. Arapaho is a third popular variety among organic farmers in Nebraska. In recent years, the only wheat varieties offered by a Nebraska organic certified seed business were Carl 92 and Arapaho. The limited number of varieties and the small volume of organic wheat production make each year and its hazards a risk for organic millers. From the farmer's perspective, even though they would prefer higher yielding varieties, it would take a lot of convincing for them to change from a variety that they know the millers will accept. When we started testing varieties on an organic farm in 2006, Wahoo had surprisingly good yield performance during dry years compared to conventional plots. Since then, we found that only 30% of the highest yielding lines in conventional trials were also the highest yielding in organic trials. We also found that buckskin and Carl 92 were among the lower yielding lines in our trials. What traits in these lines did farmers value more than yield? We already noted that protein content for bread quality was important in choosing Carl 92. An important trait for farmers in the panhandle is coleoptile length. A longer coleoptile is needed when planting deep to reach moisture. Buckskin has a 4 inch coleoptile. In our F6 nursery, only 11 of 280 of our experimental lines have long coleoptiles as long as buckskin, which severely limits our ability to select high-performing lines with this trait. In our advanced nurseries, the number has dwindled from 17 a couple of years ago to only one of 120 lines this year. But despite the rarity, we have an exceptional long coleoptile experimental line NEO 8457 that also has higher than average protein content. Organic grain buyers informed us <clears throat> that the wheat they buy must have a test weight of at least 58 pounds per bushel. This poses a dilemma for us because some of our best lines for yield in organic systems that also have good quality, uh, namely Wahoo and NEO 3490, 
are inherently low in test weight. We need to either abandon these good lines or to educate the value chain to accept low test weights for specific varieties. <clears throat> Fusarium head blight is a menace to grain quality in its production of vomit toxin, especially for the whole flower market. Our experience with screening for FHB is that we need several years of data to be confident in labeling a line as resistant because it is difficult to get good infection rates and spread of the disease some years. There are no real resistant varieties, only varied degrees of susceptibility. The most consistent, least susceptible varieties are Lyman and Expedition. Overlin and Good Streak are often mentioned as um, re, uh, resistant or least susceptible lines from UNL, but I'm not entirely sure that Overlin fits that category. Two seed-borne fungal diseases show up when um, fungicidal seed treatments are not used as in organic farming. Black tip, shown at the top, <clears throat> and common bunt, shown at the bottom, um, this color flower, and common bunt imparts a fishy odor. We expected great th things from Wesley and Rubidoux uh, varieties based on high yield and excellent bread quality in conventional trials. Our hopes were dashed by common bunt that reduced their yields to the bottom of the organic trials in 2008. This disease is difficult to screen in a breeding program because incidence is sporadic. So we ignored common bunt for a few years until in 2012 at Clay Center, conditions converged, late planting into cool soils that enabled spores to infect the seedlings. Three of our most promising experimental lines, including Carl 92, had severe common bunt. We also had high expectations for excellent bread quality and yield for our most recent release, McGill. But in organic plots, McGill had both high yield and low protein, and the baking results were equally poor. Surprisingly, our highest yielding varieties, Overland and McGill, had the highest levels of uh, total phenolic antioxidants across locations over a three-year period. On the other hand, one of our lowest yielding lines, buckskin, was also the lowest in antioxidants. This inverse relationship between yield and antioxidants was not as evident for our other lines. As for Overland, <clears throat> it is suitable for the breakfast cereal market, but unfortunately makes poor bread. Now we are make our way back to the protein content traits so favored by millers and farmers. We wonder if high protein lines might deplete soil nitrogen that is already scarce on many organic farms. Perhaps it is possible that a line with low protein content but higher in quality protein would use less nitrogen. Preliminary studies in, indicate that three of our most promising lines um, I won't give the names of them here, bake well at grain protein content as low as 10.5%. As noted earlier, promising cultivars are in the process of being evaluated for quality at multi, mul multiple protein levels. The purpose is to de determine the protein threshold at which they ba bake well. <coughs> in summary, Although quite a few lines yield well in organic environments that do not necessarily perform well in conventional management systems, very few lines have adequate resistance to seedborne disease and FHB. Very few longs, lines have long coleoptils. Very few have both excellent bread quality and yield. To view uh, the data in this table, a NEB guide will soon be available on selecting winter wheat cultivar virus for organic production. I conclude that focusing on yield and white flower bread quality did discover several adequate lines for organic production that mostly overlap with recommended lines for conventional production, but they did little to pr improve the chances of 
attaining lines with the optimal combination of traits to match the needs of organic markets and production within specific ecozones. To improve our chances for success, I recommend that before testing experimental lines in replicated organic yield trials, selected lines should be screened in a low nitrogen environment using an assay that can predict whole wheat bread quality. The lines selected for screening in this nursery should have exceptional resistance to seedborne diseases and FHB for subhuman ecozones and should have long coleoptiles for semi-arid ecozones. And I'll turn this over to Vicki to talk on the antioxidants. Thank you. All right, so if we go to our front page, this is just basically introduction of what that I do and I, what I participate in this group and that I study the organic crops grown in Nebraska. And I specifically emphasize those comp components in organic crops um, based on the phenolic based antioxidants. And the crops that I'm interested in are the soybeans, the grains, the corn, and the um, high oil sunflower seeds. I'm going to turn the slide next. And this shows an outline of what I'd like to present today. What are phenolic compounds first and foremost? what our goals and our outcomes from this research, and then just show you an example of some of that research Muted. that we are doing, and the data results from that one study, and then ongoing studies that are continuing through these studies, and some of our final impacts. So what are the funnels and the plant-based anti antioxidants? In general information, phytochemicals are those that are widely distributed through the nature. They usually are found in plants, but not necessarily so. You can find them in fish, you can find them in butterflies, certain insects, that sort of thing too. But they're most notably known for their presence in plants. Now when they are present in plants, they are they're present in very small amounts. We're talking parts per billion, parts per million. Uh, they really are so much smaller than our main components of food. But what's really interesting about these types of chemicals is that they're very chemically diverse compounds. And we have found that consumption of foods rich in these chemical diverse uh, compounds or what we call micronutrients at this stage is that we have been shown that they have been lowered links to uh, risk for cancer, heart disease, arthritis, Alzheimer's, diabetes, and Parkinson's disease. Amongst, amongst um, of them, there's others of course to talk about here, but I just named a few. So what a phenol is? A phenol is anything that has this ring structure, uh, a six, a six uh, base to the ring structure with bonds throughout, conjugated throughout the ring structure, and an OH group sticking from it. It then can morph into a higher structure Again, with the more acetic type compounds coming out of them, I wish I could have a pencil to show you these. But you can see from the example I've given, you still see the hydroxyl groups with the ring structures and, and some of the different types of stereoisomers that can arise from this. These are called phenolic acids and that they contain all the C, C, O, A, A, COHO groups. And then we got the stilphanoids to the right. The stilphanoids have two phenolic rings, and the stilphanoid I put up here because it's called resveratrol. 
the spiritual has been implemented in so many different types of health mechanisms and health care products that I didn't think we should go without talking about these just a little bit. Oops, going the wrong way. Sorry about that. And then on top here, we've got some other polyphenols that group by, you know, coming together more closely. They have some interesting qualities, qualities that most people don't study too often, but I do want to tell everybody that they still are in the plant system, and we don't know how they act synergistically with other plants to elicit a, health, a higher health benefit than what we would see if they were gone. And then we got my favorite, the flavonoids. The flavonoids are characterized by these three winged structures, cyclic structures. Um, you've got two close by each other that are bonded to one another and another one that has a long chain and then bonded further away. The one closest to the, um, the middle one is called A. The one further away from the, call the, from the middle is called B. And the, little, and the one in the middle is called C. So when we test all of these compounds, we have a method in place that we can test all of them, and we call those total phenols, the total phenol test. When we go to flavonoids, we can further, um, to, to, let's see, uh, disintegrate them, uh, deconstruct them into their individual structures. So here we got an isoflavin that goes into isoflavonone, that goes into genistein, that goes into denistein, right, just virtues of little changes in these functional groups. Now, isoflavonoid is known for being in soy. You have, if you go down to the flanose group, they are also shown by the fact that they have these double bond O groups. But then it goes over to quercetin. And quercetin is a ubiquitous type of flavonoid that's found in most foods. So there's quite a few of these types of flavonoids. Plus, they can be conjugated to so many different types of sugars and, uh, you know, uh, glyco. Um, components, things like that, that we can get up to 4,000 to 8,000 different types of phenols. So to monitor all of these, we call them the total flavonoids. So what we want to do is that second antioxidants or phenols are called secondary metabolites. That's the synthesis by different plants in response to stress. That is what they do. They try to defend the plant from any type of wounding, stage of growth, drought, weed, insect pressure, UV radiation, soil nutrient content, location, infection, and cultivar. They are not considered the main component of food at all. They are, they are contained within the food, again, at very small levels, but they, um, the small amount present, present gives a lot for their pack. So what we wanted to do was determine the phenol flavonoid levels of organic grown groups in response to different factors, considering that they would be going through these different types of stresses all the time. And so our outcome was to provide information on the optimal crops, cultivars, and organic farming practices to implement in different areas throughout Nebraska that promote some healthy crops that are prevalent in our state. Here's a picture of Nebraska with the various organic lands that have been set aside by the university for us to do these types of experimentation. Uh, 
Charles has talked about Haskell Lab, um, which is shown at the northern, uh, northern eastern side of the state. Then we have this Ag Research Development Center, which is Mead. And then we have the Central, Central Ag Lab Clay Center, which is about the middle south central part of the state. And then over by Sydney, the High Plains um, Ag Lab. And we have organic plates or organic plots in each of these areas now. So one of our first studies is that um, we wanted to determine how phenols and flavonoids could be affected when grown through these different areas in in uh, our state. But in regions that are very different in terms of their agricultural, you know. So we had 19 different wheat lines were grown under organic conditions. We grow we grow them in four locations throughout Nebraska, and then we monitored for their total phenol flavonoid levels, and then we monitored them for their antioxidant capacity. We are in the process of doing proximates, which includes uh, protein, carbohydrates, water, minerals, uh, the, the fat, and fat, and, carb and carbohydrates there we do. And our long-term related back to yield, and we want to relate this back to yield and other quality characteristics that our colleagues are also working on. So just to show you a couple things, because we have so much going on, I wanted to show you the differences in total phenols in terms of what happens when they were planted in Haskell Lab, Ag Lab, the Ag Research Development Center in Mead, and South Central Ag Lab and Clay Center. And if you look at the top of Haskell Lab, you can see that there are differences in the amount of phenols being produced in response to the different lines of wheat that were used. The most, uh, the, the most predominant phenol was by millennium. The least amount of phenols was overland. However, what I thought was interesting about Haskell Lab is that even though you saw these high and lows, the overall variability between each of these lines were very low, which, you know, very low low variability is a good thing. And our average between all of those types of lines were 0.389 mg per gram. That's not the highest we've ever gotten from Haskell. We have gotten up from Haskell to be about 0 0.5, 0 0.6 um, grams per mig. I'm sorry, mig, milligrams per gram. That was in 2008. Uh, so, you know, but we had a lot more variability then, too. So what we have to determine is, is variability worse or getting higher yields with higher variabilities a better option to go to. For the Egg Research Development Center, we found that the highest yields were NEO5425. Again, it wasn't that much higher, but we got about 0.4 mg per gram for this phenol. But the rest remained about to fairly the same, not a lot of variability between them. And together as a group, we obtained about 0.382 um, mg per gram of phenol. And for the last one, clay counter, this, this was the lowest um, in terms of producing phenolics. It did show several trends and that a lot of the, the lines show very various trends, with the highest trend being overland, with the lowest trend being buckseed. 
but again, I, I was happy to see that the variability was more consistent than what we have seen in the past, even though in the past we have gotten to be about 0.6. So, but that it could go back and forth as well. Now for the flavonoids, and I prep flavonoids because they are known through health promoting research that flavonoids are probably a little bit more potent than, flavono than the flavonoid acids, things like that, the other things that I've shown you, even though they are around at a lower amount. So for the Haskell lab, there was no statistical difference between any of those lines during the wheat lines during 2011. They all showed about 0.1 plus or minus 0.02 um, for their overall amount to be about average amount to be 0 0.099. We did see a little bit more high, higher averages. Uh, with the has, I'm sorry, the mead, and that was 0 0.166. But again, the variability, although it doesn't look like it compared to the Haskell, was actually a lot less than what we saw in 2008. The, but the yields were about the same. The yields don't change with the flavonoids too much throughout the years. So, um, and we see about the same uh, McGill, NE05, all of those being the higher producers. Going back now to Clay County, again, you see not a lot of variability between the flavonoids. Some of it, the NE093 show high yields, the barrel shows lower yields. For overall average of 0 0.0988, so not much different than Haskell Labs. And our, if you look to the right too, I have the average antioxidant capacity, and they were about 440 micromole per hundred grams of product compared to the Haskell, which was 4,008 micromole per 100 grams, which was a lot higher than what we saw with the need, even though it seemed that they might have a little bit more phenols there. And after looking at all of this data, I am really getting more and more convinced it's just not total that we're looking at and the total thing that we're looking at is that what we need to do more compositional analysis of each of these to determine what types of phenols or phenolic acids are really exerting their effect. So we are we do have data from 2008 to 2011 to look at that type of data and we are going through each of them methodically to really understand the genetics versus the environmental have on each of these wheat lines at the different types of um, the different locations in Nebraska. But other work that I, we are doing that I don't want to count out and because of lack of time is that we are evaluating organic grown crops for phenolic compounds and their health promoting um, for uh, the health promoting benefits, I should say, across cross types, we do know that sunflower seeds produce much higher phenolic and flavonoids and antioxidant capacity than wheat does. And we do know that soy does a certain time too. We just don't know how they are affected by cultivars by location, by nutrient treatment across years, um, disease stressors. And when I say disease stressors, I'm not only talking about the diseases that the crop itself can um, can uh, face, but I'm also talking about the disease stressors that humans 
eat and we also can can assimilate into our own bodies. And we also have not done any work with conventional crops. We're talking to a few people about looking into this, but this is really a major, major area that we need to address to understand conventional crop farming practices with organic crop farming practices and how all they they all help um, produce a better, healthier food. And so the final long-term impact of my research, which I hope will integrate to everybody else's research is to produce a healthy crop, um, be it from what we eat, but how we grow them and how it affects the environment and so forth. So with that, I thank you all.